teacher's voice, but this is better. Thank you for telling me. I'll start over. <laughs> Welcome to the second of our series of World War II series. And we had to reschedule the last program, which was to have been Tom Jones, but we have rescheduled him uh, for March 11th. And thank goodness today it's sunny and we didn't have to reschedule this one. We're very grateful. We have today with us some women who were either in the service or had some reason uh, that they were helping out. And also uh, we asked two women who were uh, the wives of servicemen. We realize a great many of you probably had your husbands in the service, but they had something special, and so uh, we did ask them to join with us. And uh, we're very grateful for all of you for coming, and I want to introduce Matt Roselle and say a very special thank you for his all that he's doing for us with this series. So, Matt. <laughs> Testing. I'm working too much right now. Uh, thank you very much. I'm from Hudson Falls High School. My name is Matthew Rizal. Uh, you may have met me before. I teach a history course on World War II, and uh, I teach global history and geography as well, which is basically world history with American mixed in. Uh, one of my goals as a history teacher is to try to capture as many stories from the Second World War and their generation as I can. My students and I go out and conduct interviews. In fact, we just concluded a course in which several of the residents here, many of you in the audience, were actually interviewed one-on-one -on -one by my students. And this portion of our program is basically for me to come over here, try and get some students to come. I say, I have one of my students in the audience here, and my daughter's in the back row, trying to hide. <laughs> but we're here because uh, we want to present these stories. And everybody has a story to tell. Every person in this room has a story to tell. So this series is set up to uh, basically introduce individuals and what they did during this time period. And we're recording them for posterity. Uh, today we're under a bit of a time constraint. I see Sonny set a nice stop clock up here in front of me. We have one hour, one hour exactly. So I have a series of questions that I'm going to ask uh, each of our five women uh, when Edie comes in to, to answer in turn, and uh, we'll go from there and hopefully have some time for questions and answers at the end. Okay? So I think I'm going to ask the first question. First, I need to uh, just make a statement to Vince DeSantis. Vince, are you here? Yes. Vince, yes. Sonny asked me to make sure to recognize the fact that your family during the Second World War, you were running your restaurant. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people in this room remember that your folks had a policy to serve any serviceman who came in a meal for free. So we just wanted to point that out and recognize that. <laughs> yeah, the DeSantis did all the cooking. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to sit down and we'll start our interview. And the first question we usually ask is, uh, I usually ask, my students ask all of the people that they talk to one standard question to start the interview rolling. And this is the question. It's basically uh, December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. The standard question we ask is, do you remember where you were and what you were doing? And I'll turn the microphone over to Marge to answer that first. I was going to be a bridesmaid at my best friend's wedding. And we were at a party, 
a shower and we had the radio on. Someone came in and said, turn the radio on. And we turned it on and we heard about Pearl Harbor being bombed. It certainly put a pallor on the party. And um, I can remember very vividly that. Where were you? I was in Del Mar, New York. And um, that's where the party was held. But it was a joyous occasion until that. Hi, Nicole. I was in Detroit at school, at the Merrill Palmer School. I was a junior at Cornell at the time, I was a senior, and I was over there on a fellowship. And on Sunday, which is what Pearl Harbor was, we had to entertain the General Motors boys. So we, and we were all normally sitting in the dining room at the end of the meal when it was announced that Pearl Harbor had um, taken place. And I don't know how the fellas felt, but it just sort of passed over our heads at the time. I'm going to read mine, okay? Sure. Okay. I take a course in writing. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> no. <laughs> Too much? No, no, no. So, so I decided to write my experiences. I was 21 in my senior year of nursing school when I received a letter from the United States government inviting me to come to Fort Dix, New Jersey. The Army and Navy needed nurses. It was a critical time of the war. The regular army nurses were overseas and our boys were shipped, being shipped home. Thus I became known as the cadet nurse. I arrived at the camp, no car was available, and I became lost immediately. This was a new experience for all of us in the United States. We didn't know what to expect, but somehow we stepped forward and we made it. I was going to be a combination of Clara Bow, Florence Nightingale, and Lorraine Young. <laughs> as soon as someone found me, I was directed to Cadet Barracks. That was after I showed them my army papers and we were and I was settled. I had a lovely roommate from I've forgotten where. <laughs> Jersey City. And from that day forward we became best friends. The days following were spent on the introduction of shop zero lectures and gorgeous uniforms designed by Oli Cassini. In case you're too young to know who Oli Cassini is, was, he was the most famous designer of the day. The first day on the floors were a shock to us all. Somehow we never expected to see these beautiful young men so badly hurt. It was a big shock for them, too, seeing so many young women and girls that looked like their little sisters in uniform. Emotion. My service in Fort Dix was educational and maturing. The boys on my ward became my brothers and we laughed and we cried with them. They were heroes and little boys. Our previous days in nursing school were difficult. We had exams, we used to work on the floors, 
And most of the time, we felt like slaves. Socially, we had to be in our rooms at 10 o'clock and in bed 10.30. Socially, we had no dates, we had no makeup, and our hair had to be above our collars. The, that changed dramatically at four days. My roommate, May, had a sister who worked in a cosmetic and Perkins store. She was our source. Suddenly, these pale, unattractive young kids looked like movie stars. The hair was hanging over one eye, the perfume was reeking, and to say the least, we gave a great boost to the morale of the soldiers. We worked hard and gave them a great deal of care and encouragement and felt we accomplished our, our missions. My service time at Fort Dix was educational and mature. August 1945 was a momentous time. That day, the war ended. There were cheers and prayers. Our patients on the ward, 27, were bed patients. You can't imagine the excitement. All hell broke out. And they decided to ask me a favor. Would I go out of camp and buy them a case of Southern Comfort? <laughs> it didn't seem like such a great task to me. I figured a case and all these kids, nothing would happen. These were the heroes, and anything they wanted was okay with me. Well, I secured the Southern Comfort. This is when I was surprised. They became drunk. <laughs> With one drink, they jumped out the windows, tried to march to other wards, screamed, celebrated. And, you know, it, it didn't upset me too much. I didn't think anything was going to happen. But there's always a but. No liquor is to be brought in to a fort from outside. I was caught. I didn't deny it. I was assigned to my barracks where I would remain until the punishment was decided. Most of the scuttlebutt was that I would be shipped home to my school and dismissed from my class. I had one month to finish. I was heartbroken. Thankfully, the gods were with me. They never sent me home. They just scared me to death. And so I became the pinup girl of Ward 27. <laughs> Question, Pearl Harbor, what was going through your mind? Where were you? I was at home I was, uh, in the afternoon getting ready to go out for the evening. And I, I just couldn't, I actually didn't understand it. Just, just boggled my mind. Although I had had acquaintances that were in the reserves and had gone on hither and thither. But I, I just didn't miss them all. Where were you located? I was in uh, Rye, New York. Rye, New York. And the question is, do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news of Pearl Harbor? Yes, I do. I remember exactly. I was at my brother's house, and we were listening to the radio. Okay. Talk right into the mic. I was listening to the radio with my family, and we heard this news. Okay, I'm so sorry. This has been my bad day.
day. Uh, You're here with us. That's all that yeah. matters. Well, I have to preface all this. I had I had known my husband, and uh, he, we weren't married at the time. But it was shortly after we were supposed to go to. We were married. And he entered the war, went to went to the islands because we were supposed to have um, a get together, and I was going to go to California with him. And unfortunately, it did just didn't happen. He was sent overseas, and I had to be home. And it was three years, I think, over three years, that I was alone. At the time, I think I got to the point of not even knowing what he looked like. <laughs> and it was very strange because I worked in a store, and he used to work across the street yeah. at Cone Brothers Shoe Store. Some of you, I'm sure, will remember it. And I used to look out the window many times and think, well, there goes a marine. It must be her. So my friends used to say, no, Edie, it isn't. The only thing that is, she said, you're, you're just imagining it. You've even forgotten what he looks like. And I said, I guess I have. It's been a long time. Well, we were separated for over three years. And when he, when he did come back, we went to Kinston, North Carolina, and it was one of the happiest times in my life because he was home, he was still in the service, but we had wonderful, wonderful times. We used to have friends and we used to go to their homes and we never, it was just one of the most wonderful times of our lives. And he was in the service for a long time. But there was lots of fun and we made up for all those miserable, lonely days and nights. What else can I tell you? Oh, okay. There's more questions. Oh, go to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I have another question, and we're wondering, basically, Heidi, uh, during the Second World War, what did you do? What was your role? Well, I was a red, in the Red Cross, and right away you're probably saying, were you a nurse? Well, I wasn't a nurse. I was a recreation worker playing games with the soldiers wow. in an army hospital. <laughs> I haven't been in, uh, doing Girl Scout work all the time. They didn't know it, but the parties I planned were ones that I used to plan for the scouts. And they had fun too. We had ski tournaments where our skiers were pencils that stuck in marshmallows and raced along the racing track. Um, it was one of the fellows' patients said to me one time, I don't like what you're doing. You just make us homesick. Well, then a couple days later, after fun that I was, we were having, there were two cone-shaped hats made out of construction paper on an empty bed. And one said, you're OK. Thanks a lot. So that's what I was doing <clears throat> in the Red Cross in Army Hospital. Were you overseas? <clears throat> Yes, I went overseas. Actually, I had uh, applied for the Navy, but lo and behold, I didn't have the correct number of teeth in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so my boss at the time said, why don't you go across the street and sign up with the Red Cross? Well, in two months, I was overseas. I was in England for 11 months during the war, excuse me, and in Belgium for nine months during the occupation. You probably saw a lot of wounded, wounded boys. Yes. But I didn't have time to think too much about it. The one I do remember, though, was totally encased from head to toe in bandages. His eyes peered out, his nose and his mouth. But I said, what newspaper would you like today? As I took newspapers around from different places. You just, you had to go, go buy it. Um, well, what were you doing during oh, the war? I was a, uh, a yeoman. I worked in Washington, D.C. I got my, uh, when I got into the service, I went to, uh, recruited in um, at Hunter College, six weeks course, you know all about the name. You're talking that way. Talk okay, way. sorry. But anyhow, after six weeks at Hunter, then I went on to Iowa and spent several months there. And then I was assigned to Washington, D.C. And that's where I spent my wonderful Navy career. What did you do? A uh, secretarial work, office work. Office work and uh, whatever you had to do, file papers, take messages there and thither. It worked out. For, I liked it very much. Very very fond of it. What was Washington like during wartime? Well, we were all in the same boat, so to speak. There were a lot of things you could not do because the buildings were secured, and uh, as I say, it was just an onslaught of people. You, you traveled around with everybody else. I, we, needless to say, 90%, 95% of, of the people down there were uh, service people. All branches of the service, all nations. And you just, just associated with everybody, came and went the way you were told to go, and that was it. And back to March. What did you do during the war? Um, I was married to a soldier. Oh, hold it up. Um, Bill was, um, had just graduated from medical school, and he went into internship at uh, Albany Hospital. And he was there for a year, and then he was inducted into the United States Army as a first lieutenant. And he, we decided we wouldn't get married until he decided after he got in the service to see what, where he was going. He said, "If I'm going overseas immediately, we, I don't want to get married and leave you." So he went to my, he went to Carlisle Barracks to get the indoctrination to learn what the army was all about. Then he went to uh, McCloskey General Hospital in Temple, Texas, and we were married there uh, on March 24th, 1944. And I was with him until Thanksgiving, <coughs> right before Thanksgiving, he had orders to go overseas. And since we, we were newlyweds, we went home for the Thanksgiving holiday. And then my parents and his parents decided that we should be together. And so I went with him to Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, and we, I saw him about two nights out of three weeks because he was so busy uh, on bivouac and they were shooting bullets over his head and there one fellow got killed because he lifted his head and he got shot but anyway so I tra I went there and then he came home he came back to this little room that I was renting and he said I can't see you anymore I'm going overseas and you have to go home right now so I went back home. On Christmas Day I left and cried all the way home. And um, then he was supposed to leave around the 1st of January. And 
um, New Year's Eve, I was at a party with some of my widow friends, my friends whose husbands were overseas, and my father called and said, Bill just called. And I said, well, I didn't think he was able to communicate. And he said, he wants you to call him immediately. So he call, I called him, and he said, I don't, I'm not going. He was assigned to a MASH unit, and they were going to Europe, but I didn't know that until afterwards. And when I, when uh, I, he, he was able to talk to me, he told me that he was sorry that he couldn't go because he really enjoyed this, and he, he wanted, he was a surgeon, and it was a wonderful opportunity for him. But they, he was on the ship, and they took x-rays of every part of his body, and they found that when he, when he was in medical school, he had a bleeding peptic ulcer, and there was a scar in his stomach. And I think that's where the peptic ulcer would be. <laughs> anyway, um, so he, they said, no way are we taking you with that scar, because you, you'll be able to get disability the rest of your life. So he didn't. But what happened, that whole unit was annihilated in the Battle of the Bow. Mm -hmm. So I could just imagine what it would have been like, because we wouldn't have had our three children, and it wouldn't have been a very good life for me. I was fortunate that he didn't have to go overseas, because I was able to be with him all the time, and it was a, a marvelous experience. Uh, we, we were in Spokane, Washington, we were in Oakland, California, and uh, uh, he had to stay in until July 1945 because he was a specialist in orthopedics and they wouldn't let him go because they were still getting cases. Um, so I was very fortunate. I met a lot of wonderful people and I saw a lot of lovely places and we were able to be together. So I was more fortunate than you were, Edie. It's really important. Edie, would you yeah. like to answer the question? Basically, what did you do during the Second World War time period? What were you? What was I during the Second World War? Were you in the service? Were you a housewife? I was I was at home working and doing, waiting. Doing what? Working I and what? I worked in a, in a fashion shop. And I worked in a store that was Right across, I think I repeated myself to say that I worked in a store that was right across from a store that Irv worked. And when I see a Marine, I'd go crazy. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> because my friends, as I told you before, my friend used to say, you haven't seen him in so long, you don't know what he looks like. And I actually didn't. Because by the time he came home, I really <laughs> didn't know. And a very funny thing happened while he was away. I got a package with a whole box of different kinds, different pieces of wood. And my poor mom saw that package and she said, oh my God, he's gone crazy. So I, I said, I don't know. And I, I really knew where he was because we had a special code that he wrote me and we had a code so I knew he was in the Pacific. And I knew that he had been in Guadalcanal where he had seen his brother and his brother stayed in Guadalcanal and he went on to Espirito Santos. And Unfortunately, right after that, it was the bombing of Guadalcanal, and his <laughs> brother was there, was in a foxhole with five other fellows. He was the sixth. When he woke up, he was the only one. The others were all gone. So this was a horrible, horrible, experience for everyone. I don't know if you want me to talk, I can tell <coughs> dreams 
Well, love what happened, and I know you. There is just so much time. Well, we'll come back to it. Okay. And if, you know, if I don't have time to answer every question today, we'll do follow-ups. Fine. Okay. okay. If there's anything else you want to know, absolutely. Just sing out. Okay, Heidi. I'm wondering, did you have a husband or a significant other? No, I wasn't. I wasn't married at the time. Um, Grant and I were married much later, and he served in the Pacific, but I served in the ETO. So you didn't know him during the war? No. I knew lots of others. <laughs> <laughs> said we're taking you to London and I didn't know even that I needed a pass but they already had gotten one for me well the end of that story or not the end but the story still goes on I am in touch with one of those boys I visited his, he and his family in the state of Washington and he calls or I call about every two weeks still today. Wow. So there were the good that came out of World War II for me was many, many friends and travel. Can I answer any of the other questions? I'll, uh, I'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, Elaine, were you married at the time? No, I wasn't married. Did you know your future husband at all? I found him the poor chicks. <laughs> uh, may I ask how you found him? I have it written down. I read it. I read it. You just tell me. Well, I was invited to a party um, outside of Fort Dix. And uh, I knew the girl very well. She was a barracks mate. And she came from Philadelphia, and she was a nice girl. And I met her friend, who was a tall southerner, and he was a gentleman, and handsome. So I figured, well, I'll go. <laughs> well, the night came, and the tall southerner came, and with him was a man that was completely yellow. And it's called Aberdeen Yellow because he had been in South Pacific for five years, which is a long, long time. So he was quite ill. So I figured, well, that's all right. He looks like a nice fellow under the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to this house party. And I, I wasn't too comfortable. I was a little nervous about it because I didn't know anybody else. So I, did, I looked him over and I decided I outweighed him by about 10 pounds. <laughs> and I'm a very good swimmer. So I asked him, would he like to go out in a canoe? <laughs> and he said yes. So we went canoeing. We talked all night until the curfew sounded. We were, we were you know, they a good eye on us. So we left, and the next day he invited me for lunch. Oh, yeah. And after that, I had lunch with him for 50 years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my little yellow soldier. <laughs> uh, I met my husband in the service uh, at, a, at a USO party. And uh, we made a we, uh, couple for it that uh, were together. And he asked me, he said, well, will you meet me another time? I said, sure. And uh, we made a date for a week later. And I completely forgot about it, went about my business. And I happened to walk into a local restaurant very close to where I lived. <clears throat> and just 
three strike by the table, never even thought about it. And he passed the remark, he says, well, do you do that to everybody, just forget about them? Oh my, I was so embarrassed. I turned all colors of the rainbow, and he never let me forget it. He was there with two or three other colors. But anyhow, that was, that was my first date with him, and eventually, uh, he, he went out, he went overseas, or out of the country, and I went on my merry way, and we, uh, we corresponded, and when he, uh, when, when the uh, war was over, I went back home, and he came back home to Glens Falls, and uh, then eventually we got to, he were, came to work in New York City, and uh, that's where we got married, and were married for 52 years. next question I'll ask, and this kind of goes, well, two of them kind of go together, so I'll ask them together. Um, when we get to the end of the war, I'm looking at my clock, too, because we're five minutes after four o'clock, and we want to have some time for questions and answers, too. At the end of the war, well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt <coughs> passed away on April 12, 1945. That, of course, was a pretty momentous occasion, and I think everybody's life lived there through this time period. Um, so my question is going to be, uh, do you recall when the president passed away? And if you didn't, that's fine. But hand in hand with that question is, uh, do you remember where you were when World War II ended? And I know Elaine does. And uh, what happened and how you felt? Okay? Well, I, I remember... I'll give it to you first. Okay. I remember very well when the president died because... Fort Dix is pretty central to the way they carried him to the White House. Somehow or other, he was north. He, he died in Hot Springs, and then, I don't know where he went, but they did <laughs> bring him by Fort Dix, and that's north of Washington. So, um, everybody in Dicks stopped. <coughs> I was at uh, Baxter General Hospital in Spokane, Washington, and <clears throat> I was at the officers club and we were rolling bandages with the rest of the officers wives. We used to do that once a week. And um, we heard about FDR, and um, that's what I can recall. That's about the only thing I could recall. What about when the war ended? Um, we were, my husband and I were on our way to, from Spokane to uh, Banff and Lake Louise. He was on leave for about 10 days. And we had the radio on, and we heard that the Japanese had surrendered. And we were with another couple and we all jumped out of the car and I have a picture now of when that happened. And we were all like this, be for victory. And, and that night the four of us stopped at Radium Hot Springs on the way to Banff. It was a, almost a two day trip from Spokane. And my husband and this other Bob were in uniform. And we walked in to this restaurant, and in Canada it was, and everybody in the place stood up and clapped. And they wouldn't let us buy a drink, or they wouldn't let us buy any food. And we were treated like movie stars or some kind of idols. It was very impressive. And we felt happy in a way because we thought we would go home and sort of start living again, and uh, but that wasn't the case, as I told you, Bill stayed in until uh, almost a year later, but it was a momentous occasion. Were you in uniform, or were you? My husband in? was, I was. Uh, <coughs> but they knew there was an American. Well, my husband and his boss. In the party. Yeah, they were both in uniform, and um, oh, in fact, when we left, they gave us 
us this bottle of scotch, which was like old, old, old. Just, you know, Good down. They just raise. <laughs> After that, our my the hosp <coughs> hospital I was with, we went to Bournemouth, which was delightful because that's the Atlantic City of England. But we staged there for about six to eight weeks. We had our teeth fixed, our hair cut, our eyes. Examined, we were getting ready to go someplace. When VE Day came along, or VJ Day came along, we went back and operated our old hospital. We found out that we were headed for the CBI, the China Burma India Theater. But fortunately, didn't have to go. But it was so interesting. The English were ready to celebrate. The Americans were not. I was on the golf course. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I really had the best game of my life. <laughs> I was with, with a neighbor, and um, her husband was not in the service. But it was such an exciting day. By that time, my husband was home, and I was, of course, very grateful, but it was just, just a wonderful, wonderful time. And I'll tell you, I remember one thing about the ending of the war that I think you'll all, a lot of you folks will know and understand. I was in a movie. And I was with a friend, Elke Cole, Dr. Cole's wife, Alice Cole. You've never heard such a scream in your life. And she's a gal who could do it. It was just wonderful. That's a job. Well, I actually don't recall anything, but the exact time or anything like that, but I'm sure I was in Washington with with my friends and, and uh, acquaintances. But the, other than that, I really and truly can't remember. It was a very exciting time, of course, and you wondered what was the next step, what was going to happen after that, and when were we going to go home? When were we going to get our papers to get out? That was, that was the big question. That was yeah. it. And everybody... And that's when they... Uh, at that particular time, that's when they started talking about the point system and the length of service and so on and so forth. And that's really what everybody was concerned with. Only had a little bit of time to do that <laughs> before we all got out. Okay, and I'll ask uh, one more question. And this is the one where I want you to think about fond, happy, or pleasant recollections during the war. And I know some of you have told us some, really, some pretty uh, happy ones or funny ones. But if, is there any one thing in your mind that stands out during this time period 
I mean, it was a terrible time for an awful lot of people, for our whole country. But there was some good that came out of it. And personally, who would like to take this question first? Any happy, pleasant, fond recollections? Heidi? Well, as I, as I said, my job was to <coughs> make the boys happy, but they were trying to make me happy all the time. And one of the gang, I, I, I have a whole outfit says GTHK number four. There were three of these fellows that decided that we would have a club and I was the only female member. Now the GTHK, and I wish I could, fi I could find it, they're home someplace here. The fatigues that they painted for me, they have all these sayings on them. But the GTHK stands for <clears throat> the Go to Hell Club. <laughs> and I was number four. <laughs> this was my the other thing I just thought maybe I ought to tell you is this is my musette bag. But you wouldn't know it because you know me as Heidi. And this says Ruth Jane Hyde, my legal name. <laughs> the Heidi comes from nickname from Hyde, but it's one that's stuck like glue. We'd like to take it now. Maybe. But you know what? What is the question? Well, I'm thinking of any pleasant, fond, or happy. Oh yes, we have warm very, memories that you have. We have very happy times. We we were in um, Newburgh, North Carolina, poor as poor as church mice, and I can remember one of the nicest things. We didn't have two dimes to rub together, and that night when Eric came home from the service, from his work, we used to, I used to have dinner ready, and fortunately the only thing I had, evidently my mother had thought, well, these people have got to be hungry, so she had sent a whole, whole big piece of salami. And oh boy, did that piece good. <laughs> As a matter of fact, herbs, herbs of, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, his, uh, man was ahead of him. His, what was that? I've forgotten. What was the name? Ira Ray? Uh, yeah. Officer. Yeah, came to the door that night because he was looking for a room for his wife who was pregnant and wondered if we could take her in. We had an apartment. And we said, no, no, we, we don't have that kind of room. But if you get a room, they can eat with us. And I said, by the way, we're having salami tonight. Would you like to join us? And he did. P.S. The next day, his wife was in town, <laughs> and they had all their meals with us. But we used to have wonderful times together. They were really good friends. And the, uh, those are some of the lovely things that I remember. So many more, but it would take hours. <laughs> Mark? As I told you before, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I told you before, I was very fortunate to have been in so many places and met so many wonderful people. And before my husband went in the service, he had just finished his internship. He wasn't really sure what he wanted to do because um, he had a rotating internship each month was with another service. And but when he and he had won the surgery prize in medical school, so he knew he wanted to be a surgeon. But when he got to Spokane, Washington, 
he was with two absolutely fabulous men. One was a colonel and the other was a general, and they were the commanding officers of the camp, or of the hospital. And they were both orthopedic surgeons. And they let him on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of operations. And they watched him. And so he knew immediately what he wanted to do after that. So I think it was very fortuitous that he did go in the service and that he was able to experience these two wonderful men, Dr. Unger and Dr. Gold. I have another little something to tell you. It seems that that this uh, mother, the, the wife of this colonel, was very, very pregnant, and she had a car, and she didn't like to, to be alone. So my husband <laughs> became from a sergeant to a staff sergeant so that I could afford to quit my job and, <laughs> and, be able, <laughs> so, and be able to stay home with Gertrude. And we had wonderful times together. <laughs> yeah, the connections. Yeah. Mm. Joan? Well, I think overall, the, the, uh, the nicest times, the best times, that I enjoyed during the during the war was seeing the different people that I knew that had gone off to to, to uh, different assignments and to see them come back and know that they were well and even and some of the, some of the uh, fellows that came back uh, wounded nice to see them recover and get back to their back home and get back to their assignments whatever whatever good that was that was joy for me and the lane. i had some sad times i had to get used to seeing beautiful young men badly hurt but there were good times too everybody helped each other it was a different time. You know, we're in two wars now, and we don't even know it. But it's different when your country's attacked. Everybody does their best. I'm glad I had the experience. And I'd like to introduce <laughs> Margaret Fitzgerald. <laughs> um, and you were a nurse during World War II? I was a nurse in World War II. I was uh, graduated from high school in, in Plattsburgh, and I went into nursing, and then I went down to uh, Mississippi and worked at Camp, Camp Van Dorn. And, uh, and at Camp Van Dorn, I, I uh, was in the Army, but, but that was later. Um, Were you overseas at all? I was in. That's what I want to say. I, I would. I. I went, went down there to work, and then I came home, and I went, went into the army, and I went over to. Uh, I was taken to uh, London, and. Uh, no, and uh, then all over, uh, I, we went to one of the, I think, in Belgium, were you in the 28th? No, I was with the 9th Field Hospital in Charleroi. Did you ever get to Liège? Oh, yes. Did you? Didn't you? Did you get to the 28th? No. No. No, I wasn't stationed in Liège, but I went there and I bought some Cal St. Lambert crystal Oh. <laughs> I wanted to see you. <coughs> but I was in London, and then I would got to the 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 to the
friends into uh, to help us. And then, uh, <laughs> excuse me, um, I promised everybody that we'd be finished on time, and we have this extra bonus of Mildred Margaret. Margaret. Of Margaret. Yeah. Uh, we found out after the program was already planned that she could be with us today. She lives in the terrace, and we're so grateful that you're here. But it's time now we need to get on to question. Yes, we'll do some follow-up. We'll do some follow-up. We'll do follow-up um, interviews later on, hopefully, with the students. We can get them over here and get them. Uh, but in the meantime, we're wondering if you have questions for the panel up here, uh, any specific ones you can ask, and I'll try and relay it since I have the microphone, and I'll hand the microphone off. What date was the end yes. of the war? Okay, the date of the end of the war. The war ended in Europe on May 8th, May 8th. and it ended in, when the Japanese surrendered, I think it was August 12th. Yes. It's in the summertime. Go uh, ahead. Nobody has talked about the communications, uh, such as the V mail. Now, I was without my husband for three years also, but boy, V mail was wonderful. V-mail, victory mail. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you all remember the V-mail. And how it was done, you wrote normally, but it was condensed. If you wrote normally, it was condensed. It was amazing. I'm sure many people have still have their V-mail letters from the war. I have. You know, Grant, my husband. There you go. My husband was in the Pacific. I didn't know him. Then at all. I met him later over a bridge game. Uh, <clears throat> but he, he and his folks, he was an only child, they had a system. They numbered their letters. And I have all those letters now. And at times when I've read something, would say, Well, we received number 18, but we haven't had 15 yet. <laughs> And that went on back and forth, so all his letters were intact. But um, that was interesting. On the other hand, I am no letter writer, and my mother had to go to the Red Cross to contact me to tell me to please write her. <laughs> was I embarrassed? I have to tell you this because it's very interesting. My husband had a uh, Japanese flag. I don't happen to have any of these. My son has them all. He had a big Japanese flag. He had a, a what do they call these big knives? The machete. Yeah, a machete. And um, Oh, a lot of other, you know, and of course his emblems and everything else. I do not have them. My son has them. But it was, they were just wonderful. And he never talked much about them. Souvenir. But another nice thing that happened, he had his colonel, who, <coughs> whose wife liked shoes. And at one time my husband worked in a shoe store. <coughs> And uh, Irv said, well, whenever he wants shoes, you just tell me. He used to fly him up to Glens Falls. I was pregnant right at the time at home. And he used, they used to fly him up to Glens Falls to see me for the weekend. And he'd take him to the store and buy all the shoes for his wife. <laughs> you had all the connections. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> We have time for one more question back there. Me? Uh, yep. Mrs. Parkini, I'm wondering what was the significance of the wood that your husband sent back? It was teak wood. There you go. Oh. It was teak wood, and he had planned to make some things. He, he did make some very beautiful things over there. I have a, couple, a chest and a, 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 a picture frame. And a few other things made out of teak wood. And uh, it was very, very beautiful. 
and but the, the wood never got to any place. My son has it yet, I guess. <laughs> A lot of the boys brought back souvenirs. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we got one more. Go ahead, sir. <clears throat> I just want to say something. I think that you people did an admirable job for the country in World War II. What is your opinion about the role of women today with what we're facing in the world today? Do you think there's the same interest, the same uh, uh, zest for preserving the country? <clears throat> Do women play a role today like they played in World War II? Well, the question is, women's role today in World War II. Um, today, obviously, we were involved in two wars. But as Elaine pointed out, it's, it's a different time and it's a different war. And, not to answer the question for any of these ladies, there's a, too many people who don't even know that there's war, oh, two wars going on right now in our country. Um, that's about it. That's about all we have time for. Uh, I would ask my daughter Emma to bring my camera up here before the ladies disappear so we can get a photograph. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to the sun. I want to say a huge thank you to all of you, to Joan. Elaine, to Heidi, to Edie, to Marge, and most especially also to Matt Roselle. Could we have a round of applause?